cars are for the roads only, pedestrians are for the sidewalk. Actually, it's interesting history fact, if you ever look into that, the term jaywalking actually was coined because autom automakers, rather than make cars safer, wanted pedestrians off the road. Um, also, the first flight had just happened in 1903. The planes were just starting to get developed and used in warfare, unfortunately. Uh, stainless steel tanks, and my personal favorite, which if I was born before 1914, I would have hated my life, no Oreo cookies. That's a sad, sad time in history. Um, next, jump about 75 years in the past. First color television, first ballpoint pen, electric guitars, frisbees, if anyone here plays frisbee, often frisbee, great in college. Um, a lot of this was, you had a time when people had different technologies, different things that they were already using, and they developed and adapted to what they were all, to what they needed. Originally, frisbees were just a di were just a piece of flimsy cardboard or disc that was thrown around, and they developed into a brand. Now, a lot of these, and I'll use the electric guitar as an example, were developed over several years. So, although it's like said they're invented in 1940 or 1939, it was in the process and the works for many years. Now, some were spontaneous, like I said, the accidentals, where it's just instantaneous, like we discovered it. It could have taken years, but rather it was a serendipitous discovery. So then just 50 years ago, uh, is this football field still AstroTurf? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so AstroTurf, um, first ATMs, smoke detectors. So looking at that time, it was a time period where you had a lot of issues that needed to be solved. Smoke detectors, there were so many deaths from fires that were easily preventable because the fire, when you caught it when it started, could prevent um, deaths. Now what I want to bring up from the 1960s was Star Trek. Uh, the original series, if you ever get a chance to watch it, it's extremely campy. A lot different from today's lens flare, lens flare. Hopefully the audience isn't blinded. Um, and it actually, this, this is where technology kind of took a change. It was what we thought was the imagination, what was the future, was what we could create. Where if you can imagine, you can create it. Now sometimes these ideas came from the imaginations of others. You look at the original Star Trek, tricorders, communicators. A lot of it looked like technology in the 90s with your cell phone, original cell phones, and similar tech. An idea of fast and light travel. Now, in some ways, I think we've lost that in the last few years, where it is that passion, that drive that came from something that was a societal cornerstone, that everyone watched Star Trek. Everyone wanted to believe in a positive future. And I feel like we've kind of lost some of that, where it is you need to imagine a better future rather than dreading over what might be the worst. And that kind of brings me to the 2000s where there was kind of another shift. We saw a lot of increase in transportation. You had the Segway, um, the first hybrid car, starting up development of electrical cars. But also, if you look at media and the way that we kind of take in media, the iPod, YouTube, I mean, heck, I, I, even when I was just doing this list, I was thinking to myself, Wow, I forgot, YouTube's only about 10 years old. Like, there was a time when you didn't have that. And this is also an example of kind of that creative destruction or even the, I don't know how to phrase it, yeah, the, creative destru the creative destruction. YouTube originally, for those of you who don't know, was actually a dating service. Let that sink in. Um, it was similar to, now really old, even before my generation, it used to be what was called VHS um, dating services, where it was a similar idea, and that's how YouTube got started. But it developed into a form of media, um, developed into a form of media that was individuals who could express their ideas, express themselves, and innovate on a new platform. So then as you get to 2010, just five years ago, we've only had iPads for about five, six years. Uh, driverless cars were just getting hitting the roads. Google's first driverless car. That did not end well for anyone who knows that story. They crashed many, many times. Now you have um, the Tesla where there was just a guy, I think last week, fell asleep while having his Tesla drive and got arrested because he was technically asleep behind the wheel, but the car was doing the driving. Uh, and then E-Legs Exoskeleton, for anyone who knows, that's a medical device, someone in a wheelchair kind of can get themselves up using these uh, exoskeleton legs. So now I want to bring just to last year. In the last year, we've had the Tesla Model X, Artifone, which actually was made by a York native, it's an electronic all-in-one instrument. Um, Mike, uh, Mike Butera, he's uh, Butera's florist, if you know, in the center, uh, Senate, center of York. Um, at Bionic Gears, and then, I hate the name, but I gotta call them then, the Hoverboards. Uh, sad fact, if you might own one or you know anyone who owns one, they're banned on like 90% of college campuses because of the 
spontaneity to combust. Um, <laughs> would be perfect for this classroom, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we we um, banned them in here, too. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. So, why did I give you this little tour through history? It's the idea that there was technology that no one thought would be possible at one point. So many of these ideas, bionic ears, that you can change the volume of the world around you, whole libraries on a small electronic device. There was a time when people thought that was impossible, that we'll never reach that level. I think there was a quote back from the 1910s, 1920s, that was, everything that has ever been, that has been invented will be everything that will be invented, or along those lines where it was, nothing else can be invented. And since then, look what we've accomplished. Now, the idea that I want to bring with this is that it's all about innovation. It's about the design process. So now I'm going to turn this a little bit over to what I've been working on. So for the longest time, we've had four modes of transportation. Cars, tra um, cars, planes, trains, and boats. So when you have something that lasts for so long, you get used to it. Now, change is, change is one of those things that will happen regardless. We can't fight it. It's going to happen. <laughs> Being part of that change and being constructive to that change is what is the innovative process and what like being someone who wants to make the world a better place. So the two things you need, one I already said was passion, the other is a desire to change the world and make it a better place. Now, the project we've been working on, the Hyperloop, is the idea for a fifth mode of transportation. This is an idea started by Elon Musk back in 2013 to create a sonic speed train system. Right now, the only way you can hit high speeds is airplanes that get to high elevations where the air resistance is minimal, so they can hit those speeds and maintain them for longer. By taking that atmosphere and bringing it down to earth, putting it in a tube, um, kind of similar to your bank. If you ever go to the bank and go to the teller that has the tube that sucks up your invoice, I forget what the things are called, but um, it's a similar idea to that, where by putting this in a confined space, reducing the atmosphere, we can hit higher speeds faster, more efficiently, and for longer. So when we got this idea, it, we put it out to colleges and said, I'm not interested in doing this, have a field day. Design the tube, you have the rest, do the rest of it. So we were given this really open-ended problem. So that goes back to pro, uh, problem solving. We were just given the problem, hadn't really thought about it, hadn't really looked at it. All we were told was, here's what you need to solve. So we started off with, what are we working with? So you'll see a lot, if you ever look up design process, you're gonna get hundreds of results and different people's ways of looking at it. This is just one graphic I'm using to get the idea across, but it is, if you ever seen one that's a line chart or a bar, or like a one step, two step, three step, that's not, you're gonna constantly go back and have to change things from previous projects, change portions that you already worked on. It can be extremely frustrating. That's where I say passion is a real strong part of it, because you have to be willing to push yourself through and pick yourself up. So main keys, and I really don't even like this circle, is the define, collect, brainstorm, develop, feedback, and improve. So I want to start off with the define. So we had the problem defined for us. Oftentimes, if you had the Eureka, the accidental, you have to define what am I solving. You can, unfortunately, you can't just invent something. If you just pick something out of the air and invent it, you have the chance that the world will hate it. A good example was the original, if anyone knows Zoom, that was Microsoft's version of the iPod. They put it out at a time when no one really wanted it and they didn't develop it the right way. They did it their way rather than what the market wanted. Uh, next is, collect. That is when you go out, you do your research. Even if you come up with a Eureka or an accidental, you have to do your research. Hate to break it to you, even if, for those of you who are graduating in four days, you never stop learning, you never stop researching, you never stop reading books. I wish it was the case in college. Um, unfortunately not. There's more books and they're larger and more dangerous. Um, and then that kind of leads into your brainstorming. That is, okay, I've had, I've, we've had all these ideas and what we did was we had all this research we had done into aerodynamics. Um, actually, I should preface this also. We were, some, most of us were electrical engineers, civil engineers. We had very few mechanical engineers, and I think we had zero aerospace or aerodynamics engineers at the time. We had to learn to master another skill, something we hadn't even touched before. So we had to learn aerodynamics, we had to learn design for mechanical systems. And that, the point I want to make there is, whatever you think you might want to learn, you should learn, and that's your passion, but don't be afraid to learn other things, learn other skills. So from there, you're going to develop your idea. And that's actually, I'm going to start going through some of the pictures here. But and with developing an idea, you have to build a team. So this was our original team. There was about 12 of us that was just go out, recruit, said, hey, I've known you from XYZ. Um, I 
I think you might enjoy this project. One of the big things if you want to be a leader for projects is instilling passion in others. Oftentimes that's the hardest part with being a leader is you have to motivate others to do jobs that you know they can do, that you know they have possibility for being successful at, and give them that passion that oftentimes can be contagious. Once you have one person who gets passionate about it, more people will get passionate about it and you can continue to build a team. And even just less, about a month ago, we've grown to about 81 different people because of the passion that kind of was contagious. So from there, once you've developed your idea and developed your team, you can start actually designing. So what we did in terms of our design, this is gonna be a little hard to see, um, was kind of goes back to, and as I said, we actually kind of went back and forth a lot between developing the idea and defining the idea. So across the competition, there's 30 colleges, ranging from us, MIT, uh, Delft University in the Netherlands, uh, just international, uh, about 30 schools. And there's kind of three, uh, two different parties of thought. There's what's called the active system and the passive systems. And it was different ways of looking at the problem. Some people just wanted to make something that was extremely simple, kind of just hovers and it's a giant hockey puck. Personally, I wouldn't want to ride in a giant hockey puck that has almost zero control. It's only about the idea of literally just levitating, getting pushed down on a tube seems kind of dangerous. So we went for an active system. And that, the idea was actively control this pod. Now, no one idea is better than the other. I'm gonna push for active and say it's better because that was our design. But each person came up with their own idea and you have to learn to develop those ideas and kind of join them together. So while we were working, we split up into different teams and looked at the different systems, propulsion, levitation, aerodynamics, and looked at how we could improve them. So once we all came up with our general ideas, we came back together and tried to integrate them together. And there were some things that we had to scrap, others we had to improve, and others that kind of got lost. That's, as I said, change kind of always happens. And some of that, even when you're working on a project, you have to be willing to adapt and, some sort of crazy, yeah, willing to adapt. So once we got started, we kind of knew that we wanted to make this so it was comfortable, efficient, and stable. So we looked at it from terms of the user rather than what a lot of teams looked at from the terms of we just want to win the competition. So one of the big things, um, I actually have a cousin who is handicapped and when I <coughs> told him about this idea, he said, well, it all seems great, but all the videos I see, you have to climb into this thing like it's going to be impossible for someone using a wheelchair. So we wanted to look at it from that human perspective. We then added our own subsystem. Now every team was allowed to do one or two subsystem designs of something they specifically thought was a good idea to integrate. And we looked at it from the handicap perspective. And that actually led to a lot of passion for a lot of similar stories from other people on the team who really got passionate because of that, because it was helping improve someone's life and helping make it possible for anyone and everyone to use this. So what we did was we created a seat that could literally rise up. Picture. Yeah, and that's a little easier to see. That could literally rise up similar to a, a, um, uh, a scissor lift and then come out from the pod and adjust to a height that was uh, could accommodate someone in a wheelchair or on crutches. Now, once you have that idea, you sooner or later get to a point where there's nothing we can improve or we just have to start working on it, especially when you have a deadline set. So we only have one year to work on this. Comparatively, a lot of some research projects that I said will take four, five, six years and that you can take at your own pace. We only had one year, so it was kind of, okay, we've got our idea, let's start building. And when you build it, it can, can you, when you start seeing your idea come to fruition, that can actually be a really rewarding moment. Even if it's something small, like I said, um, maybe you just design a new screw or a new system for moving things around. Or it can be something even bigger, like when you look at an artist, or if any of you ever taken an art class or a computer a coding class or any sort of class where you make something, as you get closer and closer to that project being done, you feel a sense of accomplishment when it is done, that's one of the best feelings you'll ever have, just hands down. So we started building, we just got in a whole bunch of metal. I mean, I think our weight was close to two tons of metal. If you ever wanna see something scary, have a truck pull up with about two tons of metal and have them unload it. Uh, they almost crushed a few toes. Um, and then as you build it, and you start getting more people interested, and more people start liking your idea, it becomes easier, it becomes, it becomes a trend. So this is uh, a few weeks ago. We put everything together, we put it all on the base. We're currently waiting on some of the hull material to come in. And that's actually one of the most interesting things is, this is live, like right now, back at Lehigh, there are people working on this as, we're, as we speak now. And it's constantly developing, constantly changing. 
Now, whatever, and this is where I'm kind of going to shift a little bit. Uh, yeah. May I have your attention, please? Would the following CLC seniors please report to the auditorium entrance? Mr. Glassetti and Mrs. Bushy. Again, all seniors with their CLCs, please report to the auditorium entrance. Thank you. So, uh, actually, and yeah, so one of the hardest things with doing any project is oftentimes funding and time. So we kind of were in a bit of trouble when we started out in terms of funding, but I mean, actually big time because it was about a hundred thousand dollar project and we had about three months to do it. Um, I had a lot of sleepless nights that first few weeks, I'll be honest, and that's, sometimes you get stressed on these projects. Sometimes, no matter what it is, even if it's something you can start right away, like in our project, if you just have the materials, it can be stressful. And fighting through that stress is one of the reasons you need that passion. And sometimes you'll even question if you have the passion for it. Uh, I'm not saying you should put up with a miserable situation, but you should fight through it, because sometimes on the other side is something much better, much more interesting. So it even got to the point where just this past weekend, I presented to our, the alumni of Lehigh University, uh, and we presented what we accomplished so far. It's gotten a little bit cleaned up from the previous picture. Things are mounted a little bit better. And having people who come up and see your idea and get a feel for what you're working on, it could be something they've never heard of, or maybe they heard of it because if anyone heard uh, about two weeks ago, Hyperloop 1 out in Nevada did their first test at 166 miles per hour in one second. That's about eight Gs. Put it in that perspective, if you've been to um, Hershey Park, the uh, Storm Runner. Storm Runner, thank you. That one, I think, only hits like 60 or 70 in one second, like fraction. It's about one G. Yeah, <coughs> much, much less compared to what I've been Question, Oh, yes. Is it eight to nine Gs what can knock someone out? Yes. <laughs> So, <laughs> yes, just flat out, yes, if you wrote in what the Hyperloop 1 has right now, you'd be unconscious and your face would be plastered back. Uh, it wouldn't be pretty. But the idea right now is proof of concept. So one of the hardest things with any project, uh, one of the hardest things with any project is proving to people, actually, let me back up there. If, if, if any of you have ever seen the movie Alice in Wonderland, one of my favorite lines from that movie is, yes, you're crazy, but I'll tell you a secret, all the best people are. Oftentimes, a lot of these ideas, looking back at Thomas Edison with the light bulb, Albert Einstein, a lot of people who were considered for their time bonkers, for lack of a better word, but they came up with great ideas. Similar idea with this. When we first started out, uh, putting it mildly, my university was not happy. Uh, uh, quite a few times we got cease and desist orders because they were sitting there thinking to themselves, this looks dangerous, like, please don't kill yourselves. Um, and it was trying to prove to them that it was something we could accomplish and prove that it was something that could be achieved. So Hyperloop 1 did something where it's proof that we can achieve these speeds, we can achieve that control. Because oftentimes people are going to tell you, no, stop, you can't do that. And regardless of what it is, you have to keep pushing through and have the passion and belief that you will achieve it, that you can show that it will work. Because once it works, people will come. People will see what you've accomplished. And then they'll support you and then they'll make it more they'll make it easier for you to do it. When you start out, oftentimes it can be the hardest thing because there will be people not necessarily working against you but not supporting you. But once you know if you have the belief and the passion in it, it can really work out. So one thing I actually wanted to also bring up was one of the big reasons you have to work in a team and I'm sure some of you have been in pro team projects before that you've absolutely hated and despised, and I hate to break it to you. I'm sure you've heard it many a time, and I now feel like I'm sounding like the, all the adults I hated when I was growing up. You're, I'm having that flashback to, yeah, I'm, I, you'll get an adult one day, you're gonna understand. I'm hitting that moment right about now. Um, it's terrifying. Um, <laughs> so, you'll always have to work in teams. Like, that happens. But you wanna work with people that have complementing skill sets that are masters in something that maybe you have no clue about. So personally, I <coughs> don't think I'm a master in anything. I still have a lot to learn and a lot of skills, but there are people I work with who are master coders, master designers, master builders who have just done that constantly for four or five years. And they've gotten to a skill level where they could design a system that was improbable many years, uh, just a year or two ago, where it was, this is impossible. There's no way to accelerate people up to sonic speeds on the ground safely. Keyword there, safely. 
Um, so with that said, it kind of brings me to a quote. Have you ever heard, the jack of all trades, master of none? Now this often refers to people who spend time learning all these different skills, but then never really mastering them. And that is seen as a negative, but that's actually kind of what my skill set is. If you feel like you aren't a master in something, or that you don't have like a specific skill set that you're strong with, that's okay. Like I said, you need to constantly learn and constantly adapt. Because there's actually a second part to that that most people then forget, which is, though oftentimes better than a master of one. Because people who just master one, then it's difficult for them. As I said, there, so there were guys who were master coders, master designers, but they had to learn how to actually build this technology. Like, what is the construction side of it? What is the software side? What is the hardware side if they were working on the software or hardware? And adapting to those changes and adapting to those different skill sets is what can make you a better innovator or just a better worker overall. Yeah. So with that said, I'm going to open up to questions because, yeah, there we go. Um, I'm sure you guys have plenty of questions. I, so as I said, I'm kind of a jack of all trades. If you have any questions about anything engineering wise, I can try my best to answer. I've done a lot of research, a lot of different subjects, artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, uh, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering. Unfortunately, not much chemical, unfortunately. After AP Chem, they, they gave me all the chemistry credit, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so any some questions? of us are hoping for the similar. Yeah, AP Chemistry was one of the best, uh, best savers of my life. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, any questions about anything? How useful is an iPad mini in the uh, engineering <laughs> Okay, so uh, whole seriousness, buy a laptop. Just, just <laughs> buy a laptop, don't. Don't rely on like tablets. The, uh, the best thing I found for a tablet was a paperweight. No, it's it, technology is what you make of it. Actually, I, I know people who have made use of a tablet. They're great for if you want to present a design to someone else. If you just want to bring your design and like, hey, look at this cool thing. But like actually working on it and doing the work is extremely difficult. I just know a few people who take notes on it and that's it. So if you had to buy one piece of technology, buy a laptop. Best investment you'll have. I've had the same laptop for five years now. I keep updating it, keep maintaining it, and it's literally saved me in some courses. Any other questions about college, about anything? So that's a laptop, what brand? <laughs> PC, not a Mac. Uh, <laughs> 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 Sorry, guys. I, like, I don't know. I haven't helped uh, with the Macs back when I was in high school. There's types for Macs, actually. I, I, if you're going to go engineering, PC. If you're going to go, honestly, most other things I actually would say Mac. Any other questions? Would you say the investment in a solid state drive would be worth it? <laughs> yes, if you're going to be doing engineering projects. Because <laughs> uh, considering I've literally maxed out my hard drive twice already and had to download onto a separate drive, um, yes. Any other questions? Can be about anything, can be about Hyperloop. Isn't the um, first uh, Hyperloop design coming out of 2020? Yes, so right now you have two companies. You have Hyperloop One and Hyperloop Transportation Technology. Now, and actually, actually one thing I didn't really say is one of, some of the best stuff comes out of competition. When you look at teams that are competing against each other, it's who can be the first one done, but also who can do it the best. So Hyperloop One just did their first test in Nevada. Hyperloop Transportation Technology is, I want to actually say Slovakia. <coughs> yeah, um, because they're looking to connect their capital to Vienna and a few other places. Um, and that's, yeah, so they've made a deal. They're going to be doing it out there. That's Hyperloop Transportation Technologies. Hyperloop One is trying to do one out in Texas or Nevada by 2020 also. Um, so yeah, I, hopefully there'll be a Hyperloop within three years. Realistically, with safety, the unfortunate other side, and one of the reasons I'm a business major is the legal side, things can get in the way. Um, Legally, it's probably going to be another five years on top of that before people say this is not going to be a giant rail gun that we're going to shoot people. <laughs> if you get a chance, watch the Jimmy Fallon segment, Pros and Cons of Hyperloop Travel. My two favorite are, you're traveling at 750 miles per hour down a tube, you're pretty much a human spitball. <laughs> and the other one was um, uh, Facebook memes that say, and then it's Donald Trump with his hair all crazy, when Bay gets out of Hyperloop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious, what kind of propulsion are we using? So we're using what's called a Hallbach array. It's, um, yeah, what can I use as a good example? Uh, okay, it's still beaker. Uh, so the way a Hallbach array works, and so this is a, another example of, I had no clue about magnetism, even though I'm an electrical engineer, I'm focused more on the circuitry. 
no clue about magnetism, had to do an ungodly amount of um, study on magnetism. So the way Holbach array is, is by arranging magnets in a specific pattern, um, you can move. May I have your attention, please? Would all seniors in the CLCs for Mr. Curry and Mr. Daniels please report to the auditorium lobby? Again, all seniors in Mr. Curry and Mr. Daniels CLC, please report to the auditorium lobby. Thank you, God. Um, okay. So, my sister, sunglasses. Sunglasses. I'm not sure you are. <coughs> you know, all the magnetism on the outside, and there's no internal magnetism. It all cancels out and all gets put to the outside. Then, by just tilting it at a certain angle, you're pretty much treating it as a wheel. So, rather than friction between the rubber and the road, it's magnetic friction between the magnets and a Conductive but non-magnetic tra uh, track. So in this case, we're using aluminum, and so it kind of it works like a wheel, but with no friction. One more cool question. Now, this system will this be running in like a vacuum tube or like yes. what? Yes. So um, I could have put a box down here. Pictures. Um, there's yeah. So the idea, the hyperloop is the tube, and we're designing the pod, and the tube will be depressurized to anywhere from one team design a system. I don't know how that's going to run at 0 0.01 atmospheres. Uh, comparatively, that's Mars. Uh, we're running at about a third of a uh, third atmosphere, and so that just allows reduced drag, reduced air pressure. The hardest part is since we're using air levitation, that's one of the reasons we can't go much lower because then we wouldn't have enough air pressure to actually levitate the pod. Any other questions? How do you plan to stop the pod at like certain stations or whatever? You have to stop? <laughs> um, so you are yeah. launching a real gun? Eh, kind of, sort of. Um, yeah, MIT, I'll put it the way MIT put it. We're still working on brakes. So currently our design, we're relying on similar to uh, roller coasters, magnetic brakes, which the faster you go, the stronger magnetic brake is. Uh, right now, at maximum speed, we can hit about 10 Gs of deceleration. Not going to do that because things would tear apart, people would die, would not be pretty. Um, yeah, so it, it's ranging because the pressure and the, the, how fast we're going, and one of the biggest concerns our school had was, yeah, you're going to hit 500 miles per hour in six seconds. You have to stop in six seconds. We had a professor who did rocket cars, and it takes several miles for him to slow down. Um, very, very cautiously, safely. Um, we're going to have wheel, like, uh, every team's looking at multiple uh, braking systems, so we're going to use the magnetic, we're also going to use deployable wheels that would then create friction, uh, hydraulic brakes. Worst comes to worst, we literally have airbags installed in the front. <laughs> I wish I was kidding about that. Um, I know one team's trying to use a parachute, but with reduced atmospheric pressure, I don't know how well a parachute's going to work. It's not. It's physics. <laughs> yeah. um, yes. So, okay, you're in a depressurized tube. Yes. You've got to get passengers out of the device yes. and into one atmosphere of pressure. How does that occur without depressurizing the entire system? Are there locks in the system? Yeah, so, and that's uh, one of the teams actually was looking at the station design. So what it would be, would be that the most commonly accepted currently is you'd venture through, say, a door or a gateway into the station section, which would be constantly pressurized or some phase of get, get pressurized. From there, the goal is actually to launch each of these pods at full size and carry between 70 and 100 passengers. And for peak rush hour traffic between LA and San Francisco, uh, being an example, which can be a six hour drive and bring it down to 30 minutes, is to launch a pod every 30 seconds to two minutes. So that's another mechanical system. So the, the, actually, free and expect innovation. That's another idea with, just because you've made me come up with one idea, there might be something else that you haven't thought about or that needs to be designed to make it actually work. So with that, so the, what a lot of teams are looking at is a way to cycle through. So maybe it's different, kind of like an, air, uh, an airport. Different terminals, you load onto a pod, and that pod loads into line, gets loaded into the railgun and gets launched. Um, now, I'll actually speak to some of my own other projects and other ideas. Technology can be a fickle thing. Uh, a lot of ideas that people have, might have had hundreds of years ago weren't possible until, say, battery technology improved, 
pretty similar. Mm -hmm. I currently am waiting on battery technology to improve because I don't know if Mr. Williams remembers when I was uh, graduating, one of the big ideas I had was real world Quidditch and I was actually working on designs and I used it in my um, uh, college essays, my uh, application essays. Currently I've actually got a lot of designs, but the power I need is about equivalent to a nuclear reactor on the person's back and I don't think anyone wants to fly around with a nuclear reactor. Um, I could be wrong, if people want to work with uranium, just tell me. Um, yeah, any other questions? It could be about college, it could be about Greek life, it could be about anything. Yes? Why did you decide to go to Lehigh? So this actually, again, I can thank Mr. Williams and Mrs. Utter. Um, I always had a passion for numbers, but then I knew I wanted to go engineering, but I also, my uncles and a few other people I knew had tried to start businesses or projects, and they failed on the business side. So I knew I wanted to go someplace I could do both, and Mrs. Utter actually introduced me to Lehigh because there's a program there called Integrated Business and Engineering, where not only could I double major, but it was specifically designed to be, you want to go into engineering, but you want the business skills to make it successful. Uh, I've actually got currently a friend of mine and classmate uh, is actually starting his own business to challenge PayPal, which he engineered it, he, he and two other guys had engineered it, designed it, and now they're selling it uh, and working the business side. So that was like the biggest reason. Any other questions? First year, freshman year of college, things to expect, dorm life. Big suggestion, bring earplugs. Uh, roommates do snore. Myself being the one that snored, unfortunately. Any other questions? Or I can go into stand-up comedy, but you really don't want to see that. <laughs> um, so going into your engineering part, did you ever consider going into get all of these projects, are they um, self-motivated or do pe are, um, are your professors like the people who introduce these concepts to you and you get to design the project? Really actually great question. So when you, go, when you go to college there's a wide range and it, it ranges. So the Hyperloop was self-motivation. It was I found the competition and I said why is no one doing this at Lehigh? Let's do it. And literally called around to people and said hey you want to do something crazy this school year? Um, and yeah, so this one was self-motivated, but uh, you'll also go in and there'll be professors at different colleges do research. I've got a friend who's working this summer with one of our uh, engineering professors specifically on research. And so that might be something that's the professor's project or it was something that he's paid to do by a research institute. So we have one professor designed a, um, a, super, a, a super carbon uh, carbon fiber boat, um, for lack of a better way to phrase it who he was paid by the uh, Navy. So sometimes it'll be, like uh, going back to like four ways of innovation, sometimes it's that eureka moment, something that you've just thought of and you have a passion for and you want to follow it and maybe you'll start out by yourself and you'll get other people involved. Um, or maybe it's a problem solving, someone gives you the problem and you have to figure it out or it's research based where it's, uh, a good example was one of our professors was working on a uh, structural, um, new form of structural layout design for a um, way to make buildings out of carbon fiber. Um, slightly terrifying, knowing a little bit of civil and industrial engineering, a building made out of carbon fiber that has to put up with the stresses and strains of the building kind of terrifies me. Um, extremely cheap, but extremely terrifying. Uh, so that was, an, but he then discovered he needed electrical engineers and some sensors engineers to get involved just this year, and he pulled in students and he got asked. One of the biggest things I can say is, you'll have, in college, you'll have a lot of opportunities and a lot of people will come up to you and maybe they'll say, hey, I've got a project or I've got an idea, want to work with me? Never say no until you know it's a bad idea. Um, always get at least a feel for it, get a taste for it. Occasionally, there will be bad ideas. I'm not saying always say yes. It is college. Dumb things do happen. Don't always <laughs> say yes. Um, what's the D.A.R.E. campaign? Say no to drugs. That's a good example. Um, <laughs> any other questions? Is, is this uh, going to be driverless? Yes. Uh, so one of the ideas is similar to the Tesla automatic cars, but having them see each other and control each other, you have less range for human error. So it all be controlled by computer. It would know where it is. We're actually working currently on the sensor aspect because it was going 800, 900 miles per hour. There's really not a computer brain that can process that fast enough currently. We have one guy with, uh, as I said, master coder, is working on Literal, literally parallel processing so the computer 
quad, if anyone knows a quad core processor, uh, Intel's quad core processor, each processor does one thing at a time. This does step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, and that way, since each process is working independently, but in an order, it can code fast. I'm an electrical engineer, coding is way above my pay grade. <laughs> um, but as I said, like you have to get, uh, get to the point where you can understand it though and be able to talk to the person about it. That was the other thing with going business and engineering was one of the biggest things that often happens is you'll have engineers who, I could really go crazy and talk to you about the Cantrowitz limit and the fact that there's a limitation on these pods that as you go faster the air buildup increases and aerodynamics don't work. And that's going real hardcore science engineering that's gonna go over about half your heads and some people are going to fall asleep. Um, but you need the business May I have your skills attention, to please, talk to people and time When the following seniors in CLC in these CLCs report to the auditorium lobby. Mrs. Detweiler CLC, Mr. Detweiler CLC, and Mrs. Donors CLC. All seniors in those CLCs, please report to the auditorium lobby. So it's interesting to see that you actually use Google Drive at uh, college too. Uh, their school, of course, it's kind of forced, but All also right. uh, putting in perspective, so this is our Hyperloop drive. I'm the host of it, which was an unfortunate discovery uh, because, and I'll just show this number so you know, uh, this is 65 gigabytes of data. And that's actually only about uh, a quarter of it because other stuff is kept on a separate computer because I ran out of storage on my drive. It is possible to max out Google Drive. Don't want to do it. Um, yeah, no, uh, the uh, other computer we're currently using, we've hit about 200 gigabytes of data between simulations, designs, drawings. So I pulled this up uh, because we also have, well, actually, I guess here's a question. Is anyone interested in going into design, mechanical engineering, simulations? Or if you have any sort of interest, I can probably show some of this stuff up. But, but what, what, so what's your interest? Uh, I kind of like mechanical and electrical engineering. Is similar? Or? Yeah, so what we're looking at, um, uh oh, <laughs> that's not a good sign. Um, and, boy, and I'm also realizing as I think about this, some of this stuff, you as being an engineer, you get really advanced software. Cons of being an engineer, you need advanced software. Um, so I'm trying to see if I can pull up, yeah, here's a good example. So when you get into design, it's like running. There it goes. So one of the biggest concerns with in terms of design and what we greatest life lesson I can give you, the devil's in the details. A horrendous quote, and the minute someone starts saying it to you, you know you're in trouble. Because what kind of affected us was as we started building things, there was such minute, finite things that we hadn't even thought about, the strain that would be on this specific nut or the strain that would be on a specific um, actually going back to those the hall lock array, the wheels the um, force that would be exerted on the shaft. That as we were running the simulations, everything looked fine. And then someone said, oh yeah, did you simulate this part? And things broke and people would have died. Um, which is also why, if you ever heard the saying, measure twice, cut once, also applies to engineering. Engineer 10 times, then build, because you really want this to be safe. Like one of the biggest things I will say, never do something rushed, never do something haphazardly. That's when people get <coughs> hurt, and there are plenty of stories I can give from my personal life and other people's lives where people didn't wear safety glasses, people didn't wear gloves, and that's when, the one negative I'll give here, always be safe. Engineer, be crazy, don't be stupid. Any other questions or specific things? So for the Hyperloop, like, what are they going to connect? Like, major cities, or like, what, where are they going to, is it going to be all over, like, the world, or the United States, like, how is it going to be? Yeah, so the main goal is to connect major cities, uh, as I said, the example being LA, San Francisco, but also on the East Coast, you can do Boston to DC. There's also designs, and I'm going to quote Jimmy Fallon again here, for a 3,000 mile per hour hyperloop, which would be intercontinental. Um, putting that in perspective, I, that's like Mach, uh, Mach, Four, four, four and a half. Yeah, probably four and a half. Um, and uh, as um, Jimmy Fallon puts here, it's also called the diaper poop. Um, I love Jimmy Fallon, sorry. Uh, yeah, so intercontinental, but that's, I'm terrified of going 800 miles per hour. You want to put me at 3,000 miles per hour, I'll drive, I'll walk. Um, 
<laughs> yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> I'm just curious. I'm, uh, I'm sure someone said the same thing about cars, though. Uh, 60 miles per hour, I'd rather walk. Probably. 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 I, mean, oh, sure. I mean, heck, I'm, I'm one of the people designing, and I don't really, I, I think it's crazy at times. And that's, <coughs> yeah. society changes. Like, I, one of the reasons I showed you that kind of tidbit through history, innovation through history. So many of those ideas also wouldn't have been adopted. Uh, one example I didn't, I didn't speak about, CDs, they were invented in the 1960s, but they actually weren't practically used until 1981, because you had the 8-bit track, um, other things I'm not old enough to remember, unfortunately. Uh, but um, the idea is that, oh, we've already got something that's better. Why do we need to change to this new thing, or what's so great about this new thing? But when people did, it allowed the technology to advance and it allowed it increased commercialization. So CDs being an example, because once that technology was commonly used, you had the development of Blu-ray, and technology advanced. So that's one of the big things is technology needs to be adopted and adapted, because if cars hadn't become adapted, you wouldn't have had to move towards hybrid cars, electric cars, more powerful cars, trucks. So once that technology is adopted and developed, that's another version of the research-based development, where people spend so much time with something that they just develop new ways to use it or new methods to develop it and advance it. Any other questions? Um, sort of related to this is the concept of driverless cars, which you alluded to earlier. Is there anyone working on those at Lehigh, or do you know anything about where people, you know, where that's at in terms of practicality? Because I don't think it's too far in the future. So Lehigh, um, there was actually originally what's called the DARPA, um, the DARPA challenge. Uh, DARPA created the one was one of the original ones to do a driverless car challenge. Lehigh entered, we were one of the top 15. We were one of the ones who finished, and there was only about 10 out of about 100 different teams that finished. Um, the real heavy duty research is happening out west, Google, Tesla. Um, and the bit I know about it, the largest concern right now is the best array of sensors. So the original DARPA challenges, the sensor arrays that were on these cars were literally larger than the cars. If you've ever seen a uh, Google Street View car driving around with the giant cameras on top, it was bigger than that and like engulfed the car because everyone was like, we need to sense everything. So it's finding that proper bound of how many sensors we need, how can we build the sensors in, and then the coding side of things. Yeah, the original is I remember, this was back probably early 2000s, they put this huge it was almost the size of another car on top of the car. And I mean, these things were, I remember they were driving Volkswagen Touregs. And I can remember them driving off cliffs. You know, they were they weren't very good at the time, but of course now they've logged millions of miles out in California and, you know, with virtually no accidents. The accidents usually come from people that are gawking at them and crash their own cars. Yeah, actually that's the, uh, one of the funnier stories. Um, so yeah, the DARPA challenge, the, brought up, uh, we actually, our original DARPA challenge team crashed into several fire hydrants and among other odds and ends because the fire hydrants were so low they, they didn't see them. them. Um, we got in a lot of trouble with the city of Bethlehem from my understanding back then. Uh, that's the other thing, you get in trouble with people. It happens. This is another saying that I might get in trouble for saying, but I'll also say it's easier to ask forgiveness than to ask permission sometimes. Don't do that all the time, know when to do it, but nine times out of 10, People are going to want to say no. If you're 100% certain it's the right idea, I'm trying to preface this as much as I can because I don't, I'm not saying like go out and commit a crime because no, that's not asking for forgiveness later, doing what you want to. Um, but talk to people. But if you think you have the right idea and you think you're on the right track, but something's getting in the way, do it, prove it to them as I said, and then they'll believe you and it'll be a little easier. You'll have to beg for forgiveness because you did something wrong, but the results will sometimes pay for it. Uh, any other questions? But any, seriously, any technology, any engineering, anything you might have an interest in, college life, ultimate frisbee. Uh, frisbee. Best club you can do in sport. Uh, I've gone through several sports because of wonderful injuries. If you want to crew, I highly recommend it. Great workout. You will injure yourself though, unfortunately, and I can no longer row. Uh, <laughs> any other questions? I warn, I might do stand-up comedy, and that's not a pretty sight. All right. Regarding, you went to school to be an engineer, right? Yes. So, how much 
did you accrue in college loans in that time? May I ask? <sighs> Enough. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, now, uh, being honest, yeah, about twenty-five, thirty thousand. Um, that's what I will graduate with. It's an un okay. I'm, I, I hate talking politics, so I'm going to show my slight political side here. College is expensive. I'm not saying everything should be free. I'm not saying everything should be reduced price. It is expensive, and you kind of have to accept that you're going to graduate with loans. Now, if you're someone who you're looking at it right now and you graduate with 100000 go somewhere else. Like Every college is more or less the same. It's not going to kill you. It's not going to hurt you to go somewhere that you can afford. Um, but it is a burden you'll have to look at. But at the same time, once you start working, so I'm, as I said, this summer I'm a government contractor. By working for the government, they're paying off all my loans. There are answers, there are all alternatives. So I'm not, that's what I'm prefacing with. If it seems like a really bad idea, don't do it. But if loans are a thing, don't worry about it. You have the political spectrum where, oh God, we're graduating with 50,000, 60,000 in debt. It sucks. Unfortunately, it's the way life is right now. If I ever go into politics, free for everyone. Good reason. Um, that's politics, because we can't make blind promises. Uh, anything else? Wow, last time I gave a presentation to high schools, it was all about the Greek life. Uh, <laughs> you were in a fraternity then? Yeah. Well, that, that was a funny thing. It was uh, people just, the big things like, were always uh, dorm life, Greek life, and uh, social life. If you're an engineer, I'm sorry, I'm going to break it to you now. You're going to socialize with your engineering buddies, and that's about it, because you spend about eight hours a day working on homework. <laughs> but it is, it is worth it. Um, i give a good example. Some of the guys I'm working with have already had, we're just finished our junior year, and there are people who already have job offers comparatively. I know some business majors who got three, three to six months out of college and were just finding jobs. So, yeah. Anything? Life? Any questions? All right. Fraternity life. How did that function? So fraternity life is, it, it varies, same goes for sorority. Fraternity, sorority, I love to say, and I'm not saying Greek life is for everyone, it's not for no one. Find a place you fit in, talk to people, get out there that first few weeks. Can I have your attention please? Would seniors and the following CLCs please report to the auditorium lobby at this time? Central Learning College. Mrs. Eisenbeel. Mrs. Everett, so that's, that's, that's an excellent list. All students with their CLC, <laughs> all seniors with their CLC, please report to the auditorium lobby. Thank you. So, yeah, those first few weeks when you get to college, go out, meet people, meet especially older students, they'll know people. They, it's very easy and very quick to get a feel of someone's personality, and you will find the group you fit in the most with. Um, so. Honestly, the group I found was Alton Frisbee. It took me two years to find them, but I have never met a better group of guys and better group of people to ha um, hang out with and just have fun. Now, okay, I'll admit I'm going to be the adult here, and again, I'm seeing my childhood slip away from me. Um, there's going to be alcohol in college. There's going to be stupid stuff in college. You don't need to have fun. Like Everyone has all these images from all the movies about college of like, oh, the party scene, all that crazy stuff. Do you like the Prowler? Does anyone want the Prowler? Yes, I would. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just put them up here. Okay. Um, there's all these false images of college. It is what you make of it. And like, you're going to want to go out on those first few nights and be college kids. Find the people you want to, first off, find the people you want to hang out with. It saves you a lot of agita, saves you a lot of trouble. And it honestly it helps your grades and helps who you are as a person. Uh, once you, but don't, also, I'm going to preface this, so don't close yourself off. So one of the biggest curses of Greek life is often the Greek life keeps to itself and doesn't branch out a lot. Um, on our campus, I know that's a major issue. Uh, some other places, I know it's even worse. Don't be afraid to branch out, meet new people, work with other people, because that's where you get projects like the Hyperloop, where you develop ideas that no one would have thought of. So that's my little spiel on Greek life, sorry. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Were you involved in any other activities besides Ultimate Frisbee? Yes, so I, um, Ultimate Frisbee, I'm also on the we have robotics team, uh, Hyperloop. Uh, I am part of an art society that just kind of 
goes out and does random art projects, uh, some of it as beautification. Yeah. English is a difficult language, I hate to break it to you. Um, beautification of South Bethlehem, so we go out and paint the sides of buildings that we get, get permission for. Uh, that's one of those cases where, don't ask forgiveness, ask permission first, um, and paint the sides of buildings, work with uh, the local middle school kids, work with the local elementary school kids. Uh, I do a lot of community service. There's a lot of opportunity in college, and it's really based on what you think you have time for, and what you actually have time for, and what you wish you had time for. Don't overburden yourself. Trust me, it will happen. It's, I, as much as I make that a suggestion, your freshman year, you're gonna go in, there's gonna be a club fair, you're gonna sign up for about 150 different clubs, because everyone looks great and everything looks great. You will not have the time for 150 clubs. Realistically, I barely have time for two. <laughs> um, any other questions? So do you have one more year, I mean, your, what did you just finish? Your junior year? Just now? finished my junior year, right, okay. but not one more year. Two more years? Two more. Uh, before the, <laughs> it's a five-year program. Or, well, you are a double. Program. program. I'm stuck there for five. Yeah. It happens. Yeah. yeah, welcome to college, guys. Unfortunately, some things don't always go to plan. It, they say it's a four-year, but there was no way. I, was, I took 18 credits a semester. My other big suggestion, never. Even if someone, the professor's twisting your arm, do not overload. I did it twice. They were the worst semesters of my life. Oh, oh God, they were so bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> literally, I have nightmare flashbacks. Uh, never <laughs> overload. 18 credits at Lehigh is maximum. That, the fact I had to do that every single semester, I have a lot of professors who are like, you're not human. The two semesters I overloaded, you didn't ever see me outside of the library. The occasional place I found to sleep, I'm not kidding, I slept in chairs. That's the other thing in college, you find wonderful places to sleep. Um, also, it's kind of like preschool, you always take a nap. Even when you really shouldn't because you have an exam in three hours. Um, other thing, never sleep through an exam. Worst thing in the world, I have done, I've done it once. And it was, I woke up a half hour into my exam, sprinted, we, our entire school is on the side of a mountain, for lack of a better way to phrase it, sprinted from my dorm, tumble down the hill, sprint it to the base of campus, get in there, the professor's like, you're an hour late. And I'm like, I know, just let me take it. Hands me the exam, I burned through that thing as fast as I could. I, to this day, don't know what the heck I got on it. Class ended okay. Don't sleep through your exams. It's the worst trauma you will ever experience. <laughs> that was also a 21 credit semester. That's, that's just, oh <laughs> so correct me if I'm wrong, Corey, but right. In college, they don't like your professors don't like handhold you all the time, and they're not telling you, reminding you stuff. They give you pretty much a syllabus at the beginning of the class and say, "Here's the dates you need to know. You better keep track of this, right?" <laughs> okay, you're gonna have a range. Uh, well, total honesty, if any of you, uh, is Mrs. Anderson still teaching? Yeah. Yes. 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 I God bless that woman. She put up with me at a bad time in my life and taught me to be a great writer. Um, you'll have English teachers who want you to write at the college level, the really advanced, and then you'll have professors who literally want a three paragraph essay and don't care about grammar or formatting. You get a feel for it. It's, college is a lot more of real world, I say with quotation marks, where it's, you gotta get a feel for what the person wants. I've had professors who don't even show up for the class and just recorded things and sent them out to us because I'm sick literally 20 days in a row. Um, we found out he was just stuck in his lab doing research and said poo poo to us. Doesn't happen often unless you go to a college that's 100% research. But again, it happens. Another big suggestion find out about the professors ahead of time. If you can have different offerings of the same class with different professors and you find out one is absent minded or never shows up or is just a horrendous educator, skip him. You're there to learn. Skip the professor, don't skip the class. Another big suggestion. It's about $800 per class or something ridiculous like that, depending on where you go. Don't skip a class, it's not worth it. And a lot of times you'll have professors who, back to you, then you have the ones who won't coddle you, won't handhold you, where it's, oh, you didn't show up to class? I assigned a quiz, 10% of your grade, sorry. And they won't let you make it up unless you literally have a note from the doctor that you were dying. And I wish I was kidding about that, but we had one guy who wouldn't even accept a, late, a, a sick excuse. You literally had to be dying. Um, because his feeling was 100% attendance even if you're sick. And his policy was uh, you literally had to be in the classroom even if you were sick. He would give you a bucket or 
paper bag if you were like that sick that he expected you to be in the class. It wasn't an uncommon occurrence for that entire. Worst thing about that was then everyone got sick and he literally had one time when the whole class was like, and I'm trying to not be graphic about this because it was disgusting. Every person had a trash can, let's just put it that way. Um, yeah. My other big suggestion, and this is because again I know, yes you're all under 21, alcohol is a thing in college. Don't drink on the weekdays. The worst thing in the world is going to a class with a hangover. Not that I know, that's a, other people. Worst thing is seeing people there with a hangover. You're miserable. Um, I'm also being realistic. You guys are uh, um, adults or almost adults, like real world. Yeah, some of them will be in senior week next week, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, serious thing, though. A serious thing. As someone who had friends who did get arrested in senior week, don't be stupid. Just yeah. keep it. If you're gonna do, if you're going to uh, have soda and refreshing beverages, do it in the house and don't invite people over because there are cops who go disguised as college as kids. Don't do it. It's not worth it. The worst thing in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania specifically, if you get a citation you're in deep trouble. You won't be allowed to drive for a year. Uh, colleges look really poorly on that. I knew some people who almost got their acceptances re rejected because they got cited on senior week. Be smart. As I tell my students, uh, my senior, they say, I don't want to read about you in the paper. What's the positive thing? What's the positive yeah. thing? If you save a life. Yeah. yeah. Also, if you save a life, I wouldn't want to be the person who had their life saved. Uh, <laughs> Wait. Well, I'm going to take that back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no speak English. Um, yeah. I said that completely wrong. <laughs> also, welcome to being an adult. You end up saying things that you kind of feel like your foot's literally in your mouth sometimes. Doesn't get easier, unfortunately. Yeah. Any other questions as I'm going off on my tangents and talking about senior week? It is fun, though. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Enjoy, it. enjoy senior week. Enjoy it. This, it goes by very fast. Any other questions? Anything? Random things? How the cyborgs are going to take over the world's artificial intelligence terminator? Uh, there's a kid. Another fun thing, when you get to college, look at the fun classes. There's some that, like, we actually have a class called Technology Taking Over the Age of the Terminator. And it's literally an entire class about the uh, moral ambiguity. Moral ambiguity. Moral ambiguity. Wow, words are tough today. Uh, of artificial intelligence and how it could lead to the taking over of the world, or maybe not, and everyone just gets super terrified and conspiracy theory. But you'll have interesting classes like that that don't just take the history 101, oh, I just need a history credit. Look for the fun classes. They might be more work, but they're worth it. So. Yeah. Tells me I well, we're, yeah, we're down to the last couple of minutes. Uh, I, you know, thank you, Corey. That was great. you that go out there and have some great experiences and want to come back, you know you're always